is a, a practical application of this thing called reinforcement learning. So I will also then uh, give you a chance after the, 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 the boot camp is over, um, I've asked the organizers if we can have a Slack channel. I can join a Slack channel and share with you a, a, a reinforcement learning activity post bootcamp. And that would be open to you and anybody else that you'd like to participate with. So look out for more details on that once the, the bootcamp is over. But without further ado, let's start. So first, I also I always like to point that there are many easily accessible resources in the space of reinforcement learning and machine learning in general. But I cite these three because I think that they're really cool, they're really useful, practical, and they're also online and downloadable. So without, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, 100 US dollars for a textbook. This lecture will be based on the beginning material from the first, re the first reference, which is Sutton and Bato, which is a classical uh, textbook for this material, both at the undergraduate and the postgraduate level. So we know machine learning, right? Everybody talks about machine learning, but when it comes down to it, there are some common things that we associate with ML, right? Classification. Right, so identifying which category an item is. Regression, trying to predict a value, not in terms of a category, but in terms of a real value now, that's another huge category of machine learning tasks. Ranking, the ability to identify, so when you think about a Google search or a Bing search or whichever your favorite search engine is, you want to make sure that the best results are presented first so that you don't, uh, you, don't dis you don't annoy your users. They come to you and say, hey, I would like to know where is the best organization in Nigeria to learn data science? You better see Data Science Nigeria, number one, and maybe number two and number three on that search ranking. Clustering is another concept that we are familiar with as a machine learning task. Dimensionality reduction, how do we uh, take a very large data set and project it into a space that makes sense for the problem being solved. And finally, this machine translation, it's also growing in, in terms of importance these days, especially as we, we look at low resource languages. But these are the common things that you hear about when, when you talk about machine learning tasks. But I'd like to actually highlight that there is more to this picture than just those. So, when you think about machine learning, machine learning is a subset of the universe of artificial intelligence. There are other elements in that universe. So planning, um, reasoning, right? So there are other things at the same level of machine learning. But now when we talk about the subsets of machine learning, the supervised and unsupervised are normally the popular topics that people hear about. In this breakout, we're, we're focusing on reinforcement learning, which is as important and I argue much more compelling because there are not enough people who are using these techniques to solve problems that matter. So let's talk about a motivating problem. And this problem is coming from the real world. And I thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for connecting us to some of the, the, the practitioners who are actively experiencing this problem so that we can make sure that we're not solving a problem that isn't real. <laughs> Always critical. All right, so I know that I can't look at the chat, but here we have a human, a mosquito, and, a, and an animal. So what are some of the relationships that you can think about that, that capture the interactions between these things, these, these three objects? Right. Has anybody never seen a mosquito? Has anybody had a day when they did not encounter a mosquito consciously? I'm guessing that there may be a few of you, but most of us still experience an interaction with a mosquito. We normally don't think of mosquito animal interactions, but I guarantee you those are there. But the thing that I'd like to highlight is that all three of us, the, the humans, the, the mosquitoes, and 
the, the, the animals, and these can be farm animals or any other type of animal in the ecosystem, we all are carriers, for example, for parasites. There are, there are diseases that we know well, malaria, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, that are primarily mosquito-borne, but they can impact both humans and animals. And these are things that impact our lives in significant ways. So if we were to target a disease like malaria or yellow fever, it's very easy to focus on the mosquito. So there are biologists and epidemiologists and uh, behavior, human behavior. There are all of these people who are studying this, this, this problem. But if we were to target the mosquito, there are many different places that we can target it. So for example, we know that mosquitoes use water sources to, to, uh, to lay their eggs. So we can make sure that they are not able to uh, have a successful egg laying um, uh, experience. So we can put uh, larvicides or some kind of insecticide in that water, right? Or when the mosquito is looking around for, for, for mates, we can actually have baits or traps that draw them to those things and are able to, to kill them that way. We also then can look at where the mosquito is attacking uh, the, the livestock. Maybe we can give the livestock um, medication that can actually kill the mosquito. Same thing when we think about humans. We are told things like wear long sleeve shirts if we are going out in the evening in some places because different locations have different mosquitoes that have different biting strategies. So there are different things that we can do to target how the mosquito is able to be such an important vector in the transmission of a disease like malaria. What you do is important, but also when you do matters. So there's, there's this notion of having a strategic plan so that you're making sure that you're doing the right interventions at the right times, right? So some of you may, may, may remember the concept of having a, a, a insecticide-treated bed net drive where people from the Ministry of Health are going out and giving, re, uh, investing resources into bed nets or maybe a mass test and treat in schools. But if you sequence these activities in a manner that doesn't make sense, you actually may have no impact on what you are actually trying to, to, to have an effect on. So it's not just about what you do, but when you do it. All right. So all of this is presenting a picture that is really capturing a series of challenges for malaria control programs. These are programs everywhere in the world that have limited budgets, but they also have very a limited view to understand what is happening. So if you think of a country like Nigeria, will the, the malaria control program or whatever other disease program actually know what's happening everywhere? It's not possible, right? The other element is when you are implementing intervention programs, you have limited visibility on exactly how well that implementation is going. Maybe uh, you, you intended to do a particular action on a particular day, but because of the rains or because of a fuel shortage, there are, there's some critical step that was missed. So there's limited observability. With that said, there are also many possible choices that they can, they can implement. We call these actions, right? So there are many possible actions that they can do and thus many possible sequences of actions. And it's unknown what impact any particular given, any particular action will really have. We may be able to estimate it and we may be able to infer what it was, but you don't actually have the, the ability to see what the actual impact was. And just as anywhere, there is a significant amount of pressure to put the right interventions in place because these things are impacting lives. So I'm saying this for malaria control. These are real challenges for, for the, most countries have something called a national malaria control program. These, these things are things that they have to, to face with. 
But we also know that similar things exist with other diseases. And here I'm just highlighting COVID-19 because it's the biggest thing that we are all facing with apart from SARS. This concept of what to do, how to do it, how do you respond in a manner that is optimal for your condition, for your context, is a decision-making challenge. And the question I'm trying to help us explore today is, how might we be of assistance? And I really do mean we. There are 81 of you in this room. All of us are not epidemiologists. Most of us will not go to medical school. However, both are, whether you want to think of it as a very local, your family needs, your insights, the skills that you are learning in this bootcamp have to be able to be applied for the betterment of your family. But you can even go far bigger than that. So one level out, your community. How is your community going to be benefited by the knowledge that you're gaining in this time, in this bootcamp? How you are preparing yourself to be of better service, right? How is it that we are going to be of assistance? And that's why I'm bringing to you this concept of you have the ability to be transformative and to support. So if we are given domain understanding of the system of, let's say, malaria, you can encode that into a model. And that model will now allow you to be able to say, if I did these three interventions at these three times, here is the outcome that may occur as predicted by the model. The models that I'm describing here don't necessarily have to be neural network models. We are comfortable and we are very familiar with those, but it could be. But in this, the way that I would use the term model is agnostic. A model here is simply a mechanism, a tool to allow you to have um, an understanding of what an outcome would be as a function of time for a given set of interventions. These models are critical for our perspectives because we are not those domain experts. The domain experts have spent their time and they continue to, to improve on the understanding of how is it that uh, diseases like malaria progress, which interventions actually should work. Should there be a new vaccine? Should there be a new, um, if there's an issue with uh, uh, pesticide resistance, what do you do? There are people who are studying those things well. What I'm saying here is that they have encoded their knowledge into systems that we can then use to complement what they are attempting to do. So if we have those users help us by providing that model, and they also provide us with this thing called goodness, how good is a particular outcome? Then we can encode that in this, this image, which you will see further on, right? There's a concept of an action, which you can do on that environment. And in our case, we will put the model that they have provided for us into this environment. That model will allow us to get an outcome. And because we know what the users would like to attain, what they would like to achieve, we now have the ability to say, we can know what is the goodness of that outcome. All right? So are we together? Do we see what the challenge is from a public health perspective? Do we see why this is a difficult problem? We might give our governments hard times, but there are people who have when you think about what you do in Lagos, maybe very different from what you do in Abuja, maybe very different from what you do somewhere else, right? The, the, the concept is you have to be able to make an evidence-driven decision and they need our help to be able to do that. And I am talking about today and using this example of how reinforcement learning can be used by you to help them. All right, so I'd like to pause. Any burning questions? If, if you can just scan through the chat and let me know if there are any questions that are coming. So we okay, can so take I'm, a I'm pause. I'm going to the chat right now. Um, there are no questions yet.
but I'm sure they are, they, are, they, are, they are prepping themselves. If you have any questions, please just drop it in the chat. Okay. All right, so we are here now. I am telling you that reinforcement learning is the other thing that people sometimes ignore. They know supervised, they know unsupervised. And reinforcement learning is the third class of uh, machine learning techniques. And it is very, very useful. And I have shown you a case where it can be applied to help. Let's dig a little bit further. So the history of reinforcement learning is actually a fun one. And it has been invented or reinvented in completely different domains from psychology to computer science to mathematics to this thing called AI, but it's really a different form of AI from what we know now. Neuroscience has also uh, invented or, or discovered the concept of reinforcement learning. But what is amazing now is that there is convergence around what is being found or what was found in these different communities. As a result, and I'm sure some of you have seen this already, there are times when you can have a reinforcement learning uh, uh, conversation and maybe you have to spend some time going back and saying, okay, 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 what is, what is this term? How do you define it? Because the neuroscience universe may define that thing, that terminology a little bit different from those who are coming from control. So those who might do electrical engineering, they have a thing called optimal control and there are elements of reinforcement learning that they have actually uh, defined their own nomenclature. It's almost like the, the TensorFlow versus PyTorch or the, let's say, R versus Python. We are talking about implementing the same concepts, but there may be different syntax that you use to execute. Reinforcement learning as a, as a discipline is all about learning from interaction. And this is goal-oriented learning. So there's a goal that an agent or the system is trying to attain. And they are able to attain that goal by learning about, from, and while interacting with that environment that I introduced before, right? The environment is critical and the environment has to be able to provide the signals which are used to enable this learning. But in this case, unlike supervised learning or unsupervised learning, in RL, you're learning what to do. How do you map situations or context to actions? What's the best action for me to do given this situation so that you can maximize the reward that you get in the long run? Unlike supervised learning, the learner is not being told which actions to take. Hey, what do you mean, Dr. Remy? Are you telling me that this is AI truly, that the, the system is really teaching itself? Well, the, it's a different formulation of the problem of learning from examples. In this particular case, the learner is not told what actions to take, but they are deciding what actions to take informed by what they have seen when they took actions in the past. So if you only did the same thing every time, meaning every time I come to a door, I always go right. Then there's a whole universe to the left that you will never explore. So there's this concept in reinforcement learning where you're both exploring and exploiting, right? You have to do this. And initially you may try some things and maybe you, you find out that that's a bad idea, right? In RL, there's also the concept that you can have a delay reward, right? So if you are doing a sequence of actions, maybe you only get the ultimate reward at the end when you have completed all the steps that you needed. If you didn't complete one of those steps or you did the step out of order, maybe you never ever see the reward, right? This is a, a metaphor. We, we, I'm hoping that you guys realize that this concept is something that seems really intuitive and natural. But what we're trying to do with reinforcement learning is program an agent to do it. So this agent 
is looking at the problem that is being in, that is in front of it. It is end to end, complete. It is interacting with the environment. Maybe there's uncertainty with the environment, but that's okay. Noise is okay with reinforcement learning. But because of the goals and because of the, the other information, the outcomes that you can look at, you now have a, a, a tool, in this case, we call these tools agents, that can learn to perform a specific task. All right. So I alluded to this previously. This agent is complete. What do I mean by that? The agent is interacting with the environment. The environment gives the agent input. So there's input and output for that agent. But you can think of that agent as an object in the environment, just like any other thing. That agent is temporally situated, meaning what it does at what time matters. So that's why you see the subscript here for AT. The action matters, what time, T. But after that action is performed on the environment, the agent is able to look at the state, which is what I'm saying is the, the outcome. And they're also able to look at the reward. And this reward concept is a measure or a metric of goodness. So how good is this outcome? The agent's goal is to continually interact with the environment with the aim of changing the state of the environment. And the environment, as I mentioned before, can be uncertain. There can be noise. That's okay. So for reinforcement learning, these are some terms. Call it a, a, a list of terms or concepts that you must understand. Policy, you will hear this term all the time. All policy means is given a, a particular state, what do I do? Reward, I told you what this was previously. This is a measure or a metric to tell you what is good. So the higher the reward, the more good it is. This notion of a value is also important, but it's more abstract because sometimes maybe you don't get the reward immediately. So there's an intermediate concept called a value that you can use to help basically do the math. You might not know that you will get the reward, but if you think you might get the reward, you can encode that information in the value. Some reinforcement learning um, tools build a model of the environment. So if you did a particular action at a particular time, you move from one state to another state. So this notion of what follows what, if I do this action now, here is what will happen next. If you had such a model, it'd be a really useful tool or a very powerful tool to plan which actions you would actually like to explore. The two other concepts that I've mentioned that I'd like to actually define them. So the state and the action. So when we talk about a state, it means what are the things, what are the, the configurations that exist in the environment that the, the reinforcement learning agent is acting on? If for example, you're in a state, you're in an environment with a binary environment. So a light can be either on or off. That means that there is one state and that state can have two values. However, maybe you can take that same binary environment and convert it into two states with one value each. How you define your states actually changes how difficult or how hard a problem is to solve. Now moving on to action. Action is simple and straightforward. It's what are the things that you actually can do in that environment? For those of you who remember the movie, The Matrix, hopefully you remember it. <laughs> if not, you can, go, you can go dig up and do some research on it. 
there's a notion of being able to download behaviors. So the, the character, the main character, Neo, was able to learn how to fly a helicopter. Flying a helicopter is an action that could have been done in the environment. However, Neo, as the character, didn't know initially how to fly that helicopter. So that was not a valid action for that agent to perform, but it was a valid action in the environment. So the question is in terms of the definition of action is all about what is it that you can do to the environment or you can do in the environment. All right, so tic-tac-toe. Many of us have played this game. Some of us might even consider ourselves experts at the game of tic-tac-toe. Some call this game knots and crosses, X's and O's, but it's the game, it's, it's the same game. So you can think about a board. Initially, somebody played an X. This was the initial state of the, of the board. After somebody played X, somebody played an O. So you now have a new representation or a new state of the board. After that happened, X played in this particular in this particular location. So you can view this as a board that has a series of moves being added. In this particular case, tic-tac-toe is a multiplayer game. So one player plays with X, the other player plays with O, but the goal is to win by getting three in a row. If you view this as you started and you have an empty board, there are nine possible places that the first player can play. After that player plays, then there will be eight possible places that the second player can play. After the second player plays, then there will be seven possible places that the first player can play again. Conservatively, we're dealing with a lot of states. So two to the 18 <coughs> is the possible number of games that you can play, but you realize how quickly this tree grows. We can play this game or we can talk about how a, a solution to this game can be generated using reinforcement learning. So here's an example. So let's say that we enumerate all of the possible states two to the 18. Let's say that we had a, a computer with lots of RAM. <clears throat> now, each one of those states, we can assign an estimated probability of winning if you are in that state. Now, the only way that you will know that you won, unfortunately, is if you made a move and that led to a win. If you made a move and that led to a loss, then that gives you information as well. If you made a move and you drew, then that's also information. But with tic-tac-toe, because the reward is delayed to the end, you have to estimate what will happen in between. So this table, while it's important, there's a challenge on how do you build this table? Well, one way to do it, again, in the RL approach is play lots of games and see what happens. You're building a, 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 a table or a tree like this that says, here's my current state. Here are the possible states that I can get to with various actions. And now you're trying to understand if you explore 10% of the time and you play the best move 90% of the time, you now have the opportunity to understand or to learn which actions are best. What you thought was the best at the beginning may end up being a very bad strategy given your current state. So you're updating your V, your value, right? So every time you play, whether it's a greedy move or an exploratory move, that gives you new information. So you can build this tree. This tree allows you to even accommodate for the fact that there's another person playing and you might make one move and then you have to wait until they make a move. 
But now if you think about building a table, like uh, building a tree like this, you can now start to plan. Some of you have, had, have been exposed to the concept of, of, of uh, graphs and how you can use things like min-max to, to optimize moves. The same concept is actually underlying what's being done in reinforcement learning. But the concept is being implemented using this structure. You have a value for a state at time t. After you take an action, you will move to another state at time t plus one. If you look at what happened, you learn what's the difference between the value in the future and the value now, you can update your estimate of what the value is for that state. This equation, Vs is equal to Vs, seems recursive, but basically saying your new value of Vs is your old value of Vs plus some small positive fraction, alpha, times some kind of delta. Those of you who, who remember calculus, this may start to ring some bells. Those of you who like the concept of gradient descent, I know that this is, this is ringing bells or gradient ascent if you prefer since we're dealing with maximization. Reinforcement learning uses that update rule. And we'll get to that in a little bit more. All right, so there are ways that we can improve this tic-tac-toe player. So, I mentioned that there are two to, the 11, two to the 18 possible games that you can play, but many of those games are actually duplicates from the standpoint of if you were to rotate the board or, or, or do a reflection of the, the board, you can actually get equivalent states. So you can actually reduce the number of states by taking advantage of symmetries. The catch with that is you now need a tool to, to to keep up with how you're making that, 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 those translations. And I mentioned also that when you're making these random moves, I did assert that you need them so I can answer that question, do we need them? Yeah, we do. Because if you did the, what you thought was best, you'd never learn about things that you didn't know about before. But the question is, is 10% enough? Maybe 11% might be better. Maybe 5% might be better. Right. Another element is, in terms of in improving this tic-tac-toe, maybe we can play ourselves. So I might not be able to play the grandmaster of tic-tac-toe, but if I can encode my agent, I can then have the agent play itself and learn from itself. But the catch with that is maybe the agent has particular strengths and particular weaknesses so it's really easy to take advantage of a weakness. There are many things that we can explore in this space, but this is not a perfect strategy. It's just a good example of how these things can, can be done. There are many, many ways that this could be improved. All right, finally, something to, 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 to get to. I mentioned that you're building a table. This table tells you the value of any given state. As you increase n, the number of states, we know that we'll start running into trouble because we know that we can't have infinitely large tables. That's, that's an issue. But even very large tables causes problems. Can you think of any tools or techniques that you can use to approximate the values that would be in this table, let's say, I don't know, a function approximator, and especially one that you can learn over time. Is this ringing any bells? Hopefully it is. When people talk about deep reinforcement learning, this is one of the motivating reasons why you would want to, especially as both your state and your action spaces get really large, then these tables will get extremely large. So if you can generate some functional approximator using a neural network, for example, or a deep neural network, if, if that's your thing. This is a really cool uh, addition 
So showing how reinforcement learning isn't just a thing by itself, it's a thing that can be combined with other techniques. All right, so we'll, we'll pause on this point for a bit, just, just in case there are any questions, but I just wanted to highlight that there are some interesting applications of reinforcement learning that you may not have even known that you're using already. So sure, games are very common. Backgammon is a game. It was a really important one at the time when this finding came out, but you wouldn't probably think of that as a really important thing. Elevator control. Most of the elevators that you are using in any high rise building today is benefiting from the, the developments made in terms of reinforcement learning around this particular problem. And there's a slide that I'll show you just, just again to put it in context. Cell phones, right? Most of us are aware with the concept of a cell phone having a channel or a connecting to an antenna using a two-way communication. There has to be something that allows you to learn what's the right matching between all of the different receivers and that, that channel, that radio channel. It's a shared communication medium and dynamic channel assignment, which was addressed using reinforcement learning is something that we're also benefiting from today. And hopefully very soon, some of you will be able to, to join the ranks of a slide like this and be able to say that you've applied RL to support maybe the eradication of malaria or some other disease in your country by showing the, the amazing power that RL can, you can be uh, used to support. All right, so any questions? Yes, sir, there are three questions. Awesome, so let's so ask. One Christopher asked, um, is it that we give um, is it that we give it a target but no direction? I believe he's referring to the agents. Yeah. That, is it that we give the agent a target but no direction? That's a good question. So we're not giving the agent a target. Implicitly, we're telling the agent your goal or your target is to get as much reward as you can. But what we are giving the agent is a reward signal. So whenever an agent performs an action, that action influences the state of the world, AKA the, the output or the outcome. And we are able to give the agent a measure or a quantification of how good that outcome is. So Chris, okay. I hope I answered that question. It's not directly giving the agent a goal. It's saying your goal is to get as much reward as you can over time. Okay, then, um, Christopher, I hope that answers your question. Then there is one from um, Femi. Okay, there's one from Femi. So he's asking, the agent rewards itself in relation to what? I, okay. I think that's the question. In relation to what? Yeah, yeah, understood. So just as I answered for Chris, the environment, the agent's only source of reward is directly from the environment, right? It knows nothing. It can't say this is a good thing or a bad thing without the context provided to it by the reward that it got from the environment. So okay, good question. Yes. I've, I've gotten a thank you from Christopher. He believes the, the answer has been given. And awesome. then now there's one from Uzo. So he's asking or she's asking, um, will you say um, RL is closely related to operant conditioning in psychology rather than classical conditioning? Short answer, there's a little bit of both, but most of it is coming from operant conditioning. Okay. So for those of you answer, asking, hey, why are we talking about psychology here? This is one of those PSA moments where I say, don't just look at STEM, look at psychology, look at sociology because they have things to teach us. So there is a concept of having a reward or a stimulus associated with a given, uh, a given thing that's observed in the environment. And that's rooted also in this concept of reinforcement learning. So Uzo, 
spot on. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so Ibrahim is asking, can you suggest um, a website, a channel or books that can tutor us on reinforcement learning? So um, Ibrahim, his slides are going to be made available. So everything he has sent, everything he has shown you is also going to be made um, available to you or at the end of the bootcamp. It's also available at this moment as we speak. But Dr. Remy, if you have any more, um, our people are willing to take in a lot more. So they are asking for more. <laughs> okay, I will work on it. So the first, the, so my first or second slide, I had those three resources and we can come back to that at the end. But I think that they are honestly good places to start. Not only because, let me, let me say it like this. Reinforcement learning is something that has been in progress for a while. And as I mentioned, it has been invented in multiple disciplines. So there actually are elements of it that you can actually pick up in different types of courses. So the, the, the sources that I've included, I like because they also point to those other sources. So for example, the Satnam Bato book, most of these slides are actually based on that book. I love the fact that they actually link you to the papers and they link you to other textbooks that cover the content. So that's why I've actually picked these three because they point you everywhere that you need to go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so there's one more. Um, can okay. you recommend the amount of computational power we need to train an agent? That's from Ibrahim as well. Ibrahim, of course, that is a very complicated question. It depends on which algorithm you implement. <laughs> I know I, I, that's, a, that's an easy, uh, I'm avoiding the question. So the short answer is this. It all depends on how the problem is formulated, how many states are in the environment, how many actions are possible. So if you have, for example, like we had cases where we were dealing with uh, COVID-19, making decisions over a period of six months on a daily basis. We were able to run that on our, on our personal laptops. There are other problems depending on, like I said, the number of states and the number of actions that may require that you use a GPU or may require that you, you, you do high performance or parallel compute to address the answer, to learn. So it really depends on the context of the problem that is being solved. But good question again, very practical question. I guarantee you, you can start from where you are now. That much I can say. <laughs> All right, so hey, just to saying, summarize. Thank you, he's saying thank you. Oh. One more question, sir, before we okay. go okay. into the next session. So um, there's a Meshach that is asking, what's the relationship between reinforcement learning and deep learning? Again, good question. Normally we think of deep learning as an example of supervised learning, right? But as I showed a little while ago, there are elements of the reinforcement learning problem which can be addressed using deep learning. At its core, deep learning is about, or neural networks in general are about learning a functional representation of an unknown system in a data-driven manner. What I'm saying here is in reinforcement learning, you can actually learn the value of an action or the value of being in a particular state, and you can learn that value using a deep learning. So it's not that it's one versus the other. They serve different roles and they can complement each other. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, um, let's go into the next session so we don't take too much time because okay. I know you have a lot to give us today. <laughs> awesome. All right, so just to summarize, the learner is not told which actions to take. There is an element of trial and error, and I use the word search, but don't think of it as a random search. You are informed by what you have learned so far. In reinforcement learning, there's a possibility of having a reward, which is delayed. So maybe you only get the reward after performing like a sequence of actions. Right? So maybe you might have to sacrifice things in the short term 
so that you can get to the better things long term. Accordingly, you have to both explore and exploit what you do know. If you do one without the other, you will end up in essence being suboptimal, meaning not learning as much as you could or not generating as much reward. And remember, that's your target. Your target is get as much reward as you can. All right. So as we move forward, there are some terms that you may hear, and I'd like to put them into put them into, into, into context. Pun intended. So the first, we talk about in reinforcement learning, sometimes we talk about a banded formulation. Right? A banded formulation. What this means is that the rewards that you get are completely determined by what actions are taken and nothing else. This is viewed as one of the simpler uh, framings of the reinforcement learning problem. Some consider it a subset of reinforcement learning. The rewards are determined only by the actions taken. Now there's a, a, an extension of that, which is called the contextual bandit, where it's not just what actions you take, it's what actions you take and the states that you were in when you took those actions, right? So contextual bandit, you add states. So now the full reinforcement learning problem, it's not just the rewards that are determined by the actions and states, it's the reward and the state that you move to, which are determined by the state that you were in and the action that you took. All right, so in full reinforcement learning, you have to learn the rewards and the states associated with the actions and the context of the states that you were in when you did that action. So bandit, contextual bandit, and full reinforcement learning. Um, just as an aside, the, the term bandit, it is not, it is not a, <laughs> It is probably coming out of a, of a US context of, the, of a slot machine or uh, what they call gambling. So if you notice, you think of Las Vegas or those places where there are casinos, right? The, the casino, this machine is viewed as a bandit because it takes all your money. <laughs> but if you want to gamble, one of the things that they are saying in this example is that you have to learn which machines do you play. And what, like how much do you play? What actions do you take? So that's this framing of the K armed bandit. There are K things that you could possibly do. What do you do? As you learn over time, maybe you learn that a particular machine is the machine that you use, that you play, right? So you have, again, N actions that you can possibly take. I should actually say K actions that you could, perhaps, you could possibly take. And after you take each action, you get a reward. So your goal or your job is to now learn what is the expected reward of performing a particular action. And as I mentioned, since this is a bandit formulation, the rewards that you get are only dependent on the actions that you take. All right, so that's the concept of this K-armed bandit. Really useful, um, really useful first step into reinforcement learning. Right. So your goal is to come up with this Q, this 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 value of an action. So you're generating an estimate, and maybe you you keep track of how much, what rewards have you gotten every time you took that particular action A, and you divide that by the number of times that you've taken that action in the past. Right, That is one formulation for this estimate of an action value. So now if you think of a greedy action, you're for a given, now you have a choice of which action, which of these K actions to take. You always take the one that is the biggest, the biggest Q, right? That is viewed as a greedy action. But as I alluded to before, if you take the best action that you know of now, 
maybe there's another action that you never evaluated that is actually in reality better than the one that you think is the best now. Right? That's the reason why you can't exploit all the time. Exploiting is basically saying, I know everything. But at the same point in time, you don't want to explore all the time because when you're exploring, you're not getting the good reward or you're not always getting the good reward. So you have to balance. And as this last bullet point says, you can never really stop exploring, but you should always explore a little bit less over time. So the more evidence you get, the more confidence you should have. After you've done it 100 times, or maybe 200 times, you shouldn't be exploring at the same rate as you were exploring when you did it once or twice. In terms of practical challenges, and this actually goes to one of, uh, the, one of the questions that Abraham asked before. Think about it like this. You're trying to come up with an estimate for Q. One way you can do it is keep track of all of the rewards that you've gotten over time. And when you get a new reward, you add that here. But that means that you now have to keep a lot of rewards in memory. So what you can do instead, and you notice this equation seems familiar, you can use your old action value and you update it with the difference between your current reward and your previous action value and that old action value. Right? So we have this, this structure. New estimate is old estimate. Step size, remember we had an alpha, which is a, so a small number, and then target minus old estimate. Again, this should seem really familiar to you who are familiar with the concept of reinforcement, sorry, of neural networks. This concept is used as a, a perceptron update rule, right? So it shows up again. All right, so putting this into pseudocode, we like pseudocode. I'm not going to make a decision one way or the other, Python versus R, I'm going to give you pseudocode. Right? So you initialize. In this particular case, you're initializing your, your values, your action values to zero. Different implementations of this algorithm might initialize to negative one or randomly initialize. There are different initialization strategies and those strategies have an implication or have an impact on how your code performs. Okay, just seeing a message. Yes, we have one hour left. It's, I'm still on track. <laughs> All right, so after you initialize, you select an action. And in this particular case, as I said, you have a choice of selecting the best action based on what you know, or you randomly select an action. And that probability epsilon is what determines so once you have selected an action, and I have alluded to this concept, this is a policy. This policy says, pick the best action that you know with probability one minus epsilon, or pick a random action with probability epsilon. So now that you have that action, you now evaluate that action to find out what the reward is. You increment the count, and now you update your estimate of the value of that action. Right? Straightforward. This is one of the reasons why we start with the bandit algorithm, because the reward that you get is ultimately only impacted by the action. But there are other ways that you can actually have selected that action. Think about it for a moment. Here, I've given you one option, one policy that is randomly selecting either a random or the best. Think about another way that you can do this. What I want you to really think about an option, not asking you to say what it is, but there are other strategies. One of those strategies is also borrowing a concept that I know that you have seen since you have had exposure to the concept of neural networks. 
Anybody remember the notion of a softmax action selection? Well, in our case, we are thinking of them as actions. But if you were thinking about outputs, you can use a softmax as well and in the output layer of a neural network. In this particular case, what we're saying here, your probability of selecting a particular action is, is a weighted average of sorts, where your average is now informed by how likely that action is to get you where you'd like to go. So how good is that action really? It informs the distribution or the probability of you selecting that action. So it's not allowing you to say a binary choice of take the best action or take a random action. It's saying your probability of selecting the best action is going to be weighted by how good that action is compared to the others. There are many other ways that you can do this. The challenges or the point is that I should say, if you knew what the best action actually was, you could generate a figure like this. So this figure is showing that with different strategies, if you had different step sizes and different epsilon values, you would get on average different profiles as you learned through interaction. At the beginning, in all cases, you're going to be bad. But as you get more examples, maybe if you explore more, which is the, the, the or you take smaller step sizes, you'd have variations in how quickly you get to the optimal solution, if you do get to the optimal solution at all. all right, so this reinforcement learning problem, one of the challenges, just like the others in, in uh, supervised and unsupervised learning, you do have a data challenge here. Even though your data is being generated by the agent interacting with the environment on its own. You don't have to worry about labels though, because those, that insight, those labels, that knowledge of what is good is defined by the environment which is being learned from. So I bring this picture back again. At time t, the agent knows that the environment is in state t. It performs an action A. That action allows the agent to then sample the reward RT plus one, and then know that the environment has moved to state t plus one. S A R, state action reward then you get another state and then you take another action, which leads to another reward and another state. Then you take another action. This iterative process is the hallmark of RL. L listen to this pattern, state action reward, state action reward, state action reward. You can generate knowledge from observing this sequence you can learn things like if you took a particular action in state in that particular state, 10 times out of, out of 11, you get this reward and you move to this state. Or maybe one time out of 11, you get this reward and you move to another state. This is what the information that the agent is using as the basis of the learning process. Right. So I think this is actually paraphrasing the one of the questions that was asked earlier. Right. So the method, the algorithm specifies how the agent updates its own policy as a result of what it has learned. So nobody tells the agent exactly what to do, but the agent is updating its own policy. And what's a policy? A policy is the thing that allows the agent to map a given state to what decision or what action it chooses to make. Roughly, the agent's goal is to get as much reward as it can in the long run. What's long run? A long time. Maybe it's 100 steps or plays. Maybe it's 1,000 steps. What you learn or what decisions you make based on information that you learned over 100 steps is likely to be really different 
for some problems than what you might learn over a thousand steps. In reinforcement learning, you generally have uh, on the order of 1,000, 10,000 plays or 10,000 steps, right? much longer, sorry, much longer than I, I think I've alluded so far. You have to interact with the environment, especially when the, the state space defined by the actions and the states is large, right? So the policy more formally is now, what action do you take conditioned on the state? And you can view this, for those of you who are mathematicians, please forgive us. Uh, yes, this looks like a conditional probability. And yes, it shares a lot in common, but it is abusing the notation. We know, we know, it just is easier to write it down this way, right? So for a given action, sorry, what's the probability that you select a given action if the state is S? So the only thing I'd like to add, yes, this is a repeat slide. Your goal as an agent is now captured in the following manner. You can view your goal as the sum of a series of rewards. Maybe some of these rewards might be zero because you didn't actually get a reward at that point in time, but the reward came later. That's why I talked about this concept of having a delayed reward. There's another concept which I guess I can, I can talk about now is maybe getting a great, war, a great reward later is not as good as getting an amazing, sorry, is better than getting an amazing reward now. So there's this concept of discount. And those of you who have done anything in terms of the stock market, there's this notion of what's the value of something now versus in the future. That concept also applies here in reinforcement learning. So, just to, to wrap up again. This reward is critical. It's not, it's not, we don't claim that it completely captures everything that can be done in the universe, all possible cases where you might like to learn, but there are surprisingly a lot of problems which can be formulated in this manner. I'll give a few examples um, on the, the last two or three slides, in addition to the ones that I've already talked about. But in this context for reinforcement learning, you're using this goal to specify what we want to achieve, meaning get as much reward as possible, but not how, what actions will need to be done. The agent is trying its best to select the sequence of actions so that it can attain that goal. It is not something that the agent can directly change. So for example, the agent's action influences the state and the reward in the case of the full RL problem. The agent can't influence the reward directly. It is doing it indirectly by interacting with the environment. And then finally, the agent must have a, a notion of, of success meaning it must be able to know, explicitly know, how much reward have I gotten? How much G, how much goal have I accumulated in my lifespan? So it will know how to update. So I've talked about a bandit formulation as a way to update the Q given an action. Here is a, a, another type of, of algorithm or another type of update equation where since we're updating both the state and the action or we're taking information from both the state and the action, we know that this is no longer a bandit. But I hope that you still see old sorry, the new value of the state and action is associated, is derived by generating, looking at the old value plus a small number alpha times something, a difference. I, I keep on highlighting this because it's a really fundamental thing. 
regardless of whether you're doing reinforcement learning, neural networks, any of these other techniques, there are some structures that will keep on coming back and there are reasons why. The math of this is amazing, so don't be afraid to dig into it. But Q-learning, this is the structure of it. There's another type of reinforcement learning known as SASA, and I kind of did a, a, a foreshadowing of this, state action reward, state action. In this particular case, you also now take in what state you have moved to in the future as well to help determine what your updated value for Q is in the present. So your state in the future and the action that you take in the future influences what you update in the present. Kind of fun. All of the equations that we've talked about so far, I've said the word value, but I just wanna highlight that there are really two formulations of what value is or what a value function is. There is one that we just talked about that has both state and action that talks about what's the value of performing a given action in that state. There's another version of value function which is saying what's the value of being in that state. They are complementary. So if you are optimizing, this notion of, of when you see the terminology, if you have a V star or a Q star, this is saying this is the optimal policy or the optimal um, uh, value function. There is a duality between the optimal state to be in and the optimal state action pair. So this notion of Bellman optimality, take a look at that section in the book. Every textbook will cover this concept. All right, so just putting this back into pseudocode just again, just to make the point, you can look in any textbook, you will find the, the implementations of these amazingly complex, amazingly researched algorithms. But there is at some point in time, somewhere, a definition for how this technique works. What is the algorithm? What are you doing? In this case, you're initializing for Q learning, you're initializing uh, uh, the, the values for each state and action combination. And in this particular case, it's being done arbitrarily. And they're saying that the last state or the terminal state is given zero, sorry, the terminal uh, state and any action, you will get a zero Q associated with that. Now looping our old friend, in this particular case, you're not saying looping forever. You're looping until you are finished in this particular case because you have a concept of an episode where you get to the end. You initialize the state and for each step in that episode, you choose an action using that policy and you can do it using epsilon greedy or any other technique, your, your old friend, um, uh, we could use the softmax approach. Then you take that action and you observe what response you got and what state you moved to. Then you update your Q, you update your S and you loop again. I hope that each of you is looking at this now and saying, oh, that's Q learning, just seven lines of code. Okay, I can do that. I hope that you're there. <laughs> Double Q learning. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought one Q was enough. There are implementations of other algorithms which are done to address issues that were observed in Q learning and other techniques. So one of the issues with Q learning is that what if the, the, the update that you made wasn't actually the right update or the best update, or you weren't learning um, you weren't using all the information available to you. This is one of those algorithms which was implemented to address one of those kind of problems. So instead of learning one value function for state and actions, you learn two and you know you randomly pick between them. So it's something that's done to address a, a numerical instability. Does that mean that you can have triple Q learning, Dr. Remy? 
sure if you want to, I'm not sure if it will help, but it's possible. At the end of the day, all of this is addressing the same question. Find a way to take an action, to determine what action to take, take that action. Look at the reward and the state. Use that information to up, update the value of taking that action in that state. We could spend hours going through all of these implementations. Let me think about a new contribution in reinforcement learning at some point in time. It's basically addressing this question. Give me a new algorithm that can help address some sort of optimality constraint related to finding the best interventions or the best sequence of actions over time. So that Bellman optimality equation, that's at the heart. What is the optimal? What is the best policy? What is the best value function? That's really what you want to know. If you have that value function, then you have information that will let you know what policy you need. Often cases, solving it outright is difficult. <clears throat> Either because the number, of space, the number of states that you need or the amount of time that you need is just not practical. So really what we're saying is in reinforcement learning, a lot of RL applications are about how do you get an approximation that gets you to good enough performance fast enough, right? Approximations abound. But this generalization, you want to evaluate and then improve. Evaluate, improve, evaluate, improve, evaluate, improve. And there's this notion of converging after doing this process enough to the optimal. So 1993, seems like a long time ago. One of the, the most interesting findings in an RL universe was the ability to actually maneuver a rod through a complex space. Think about what this would be like for you to do it if you were a robot or if you were limited by the, let's say that you could only act by looking through a camera. This actually is a really hard problem. Think about how hard it is for us to balance a pencil or a rod, a longer rod on its own. But now you're trying to not just balance the rod, but you're trying to maneuver that rod through a space. Can you think about applications in healthcare where such a thing may need to be done, where you're trying to maneuver a needle through a sensitive material, maybe tissues or, or organs, and you're trying to deliver it to a particular goal in a specific orientation, that's this problem. And using RL, it was addressed in 93. About 10 years later, one of the coolest projects that I have seen, because I saw this as a grad student and I was really amazed as I was looking at this work come out. Learning to fly a helicopter. This was a, re a, a, a remote control helicopter. So a small helicopter, but using reinforcement learning. As a kid, I used to dream about having a, a remote control helicopter. Never ever got one, but I used to look at it a lot. We're talking of a really complex control device that normally takes hours or years of training for people to do acrobatics. What was done in this particular context is some uh, examples were provided by, by um, experts or expert pilots, and you can get that state action reward sequence, and that was used to bootstrap the learning that was done by a robot. So you can interact with the environment directly, and they call that on policy learning, or you can interact, sorry, you, you can interact with the environment indirectly in what is called off policy learning. In this particular work, they did both on and off policy things, and they were do they were able to demonstrate some really amazing things like a helicopter flying upside down. Take a look at that paper if you can find it. There's some really cool videos on the internet around it. More recently, Atari got the attention of the universe. 
Um, DeepMind did some really compelling work, not just because it was able to resonate with a lot of people because they may have played these games, but there was also an environment which was shared relating to these games. So anyone could write RL algorithms to play these, these Atari games. So it was a really interesting test bed, right? What's going to be the, the thing that people are talking about in 2023? Which of you is going to step up and say, hey, I want to do that, <laughs> but I want to do it in a manner that has an impact. That's the reason why I was excited to be invited to give this talk, because I want to challenge us, all of us. There are now 90 participants in the room. Thank you all for being present and being committed to this concept. But I'm really looking forward to in two years, in three years, what are we, what are we able to show at a conference like NeurIPS or a conference like AAAI or a conference like KDD about the applications of RL? Yes, I'm biased. I want you to use RL. But what I really want you to do is to help solve a problem using the amazing big brains that you have and understanding the needs of whether it's your local community or your broader community. Applied machine learning is critical. It's not just about playing games or not just about um, improving a metric by 2% so that you can be higher on the leaderboard. It's about helping understand how you can solve somebody's problem using rigorously developed theory and an understanding of the problem or the environment which that this work is being applied. All right. So I will pause again. We're gonna make a slight pivot, but are there any further questions on deck? Okay, so no questions have been put in the chat box, but then I'm sure it's cause they were trying to follow the slides and we're writing. <laughs> so if you have uh, any questions, please now be the time to put in the chat box. Just raise your hand so we can unmute you. Then you can have a conversation directly with Dr. Remy. All right, just as they're still coming up with questions, I want to, to do a bit of a shout out. Really proud of Arinze. He is a recent graduate of, of the AIMS um, AI program in South Africa. As you can see, he is clearly one of your countrymen. And he was actually able for his thesis, his master's thesis, to do an analysis of bandit algorithms for malaria control. So everything that we're talking about, here is somebody who looks like you, who went to the same kind of schools that you go to and you went to, and he's applying these things as a graduate student. So this is not just something that some guy in Kenya is telling you that you can do. I hope that you really do believe that this is something that you can do and you can both have an academic contribution to make because he's also had a, a paper, uh, a version of this work accepted to the Black and AI workshop. But I really do want to say out of the, the 90 of you here, at least three of you as a group, I want you to be able to apply this to a real problem. And I'm saying three because I know that you know that you can do this. It really should be higher. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. So we're looking forward to the, the three people <laughs> or more I than that will be, yeah. be there more uh, this time next year. I want to see them. I want to see them. Uh, to kickstart, one of the things I wanted to say is that um, I told Lacan that I, I, would, I would like to support an opportunity to, to practice or to be more exposed to RL in a practical but also very welcoming way. So after DSM, and I need to work with Lacan to actually figure out how to deploy, uh, I'm suggesting, and I hope that all of you will participate and bring some friends as well, a two week long activity. So why, why two weeks? Just so that you have time to play and see what you can learn. Optional, 
but I hope that you do it because one of the things you can, you can listen to lectures, but you don't really learn until you do for yourself. And I also want you to do it with people. So even if the person was not, or people that you would like are not in this session now, I want you to include them, right? Like I said, we'll open a Slack channel in the Data Science Nigeria workspace, and I will do my best. No promises on having uh, office hours every day, but at least twice a week, I would like to actually get a team together so that we can field questions in the Slack channel and provide any extra information. So just, as a, just to show what I'm referring to in that space, um, let me see, are you seeing a, a, a web browser with a notebook in it? Yes, we can. Challenge, tutorial, stage. Awesome. Okay. Right. So this is a concept, a variant of this I'll be able to share once we can get that Slack channel open and anybody who's interested can join. I will put the real version of this. This is a previous version that we had, but I'd like to use it. Just showing how, uh, in essence, what I'm showing here is the state action reward concept that I just talked about for a given environment. And in this particular environment, you have the ability to say, here are the actions that I can do at time one, time two, time three, time four, and I can encode those into a policy. Then I can then take that policy and apply it to the environment and then observe what my next state and the reward is, right? Remember state action reward, state action reward, keep on going. So now you make an action based on the state that you have gotten to. So this environment is encoded in a manner that allows you to capture the dynamics of malaria interventions. This is the same environment that uh, Arinze was able to use for his, for his thesis. Um, it is available and I'd like to use it for this post DSN activity, but if you'd like to use it for other things, whether you want to do research, you want to write a paper with your lecturers, feel free, it is there, it is open source. Um, but in this case, what am I showing you? So here is a case where you took the same action multiple times. So you evaluated, you realized that the first time you took the action, you got a reward of 12.4. The second time you did it, you got a reward of 12.6. The third time you did it, you got 12.14. So it's showing you that you can have uh, stochastic rewards or uncertainty in the rewards that you get when you perform a particular action. Now, the same environment can be used with sequences of actions. So you remember our while true loop forever. In this case, I am randomly selecting an action. That's what action space sample does. And then evaluating that action. So we get the observation and the reward. And then a random action selection policy doesn't sound very interesting. It's not, but it's showing you the mechanism. You can now write a much better algorithm than random. Here. That's the goal. That's what I'd like you to do in this follow on activity. You can use whichever algorithms you find, um, whether it's from the textbooks that I've shared the links to, or blogs that you've read, or maybe it's just an idea that you have in your mind. Your job would be to come up with your own reinforcement learning implementation that says, here are the actions that I'd like to evaluate. Evaluate the action, find out what happened, and iteratively repeat. So this is what that looks like in your own code format. You would have an agent that you are making, and you would, it will be your custom agent. You could call it whatever you'd want. And there's some initialization of episodes. So how many episodes would you like this agent to learn from? I am suggesting, if not stipulating, that the agent should have a generate method. And that generate method is where you're actually going to be doing the learning. So now looking at line 25 here, hopefully you can see the yellow highlight 
on line 25. But what this is, is the same random action, random policy, right? So this is an example of what an agent would look like with that random policy. Now I'd like to show you what the agent would look like if you were to implement eGreedy, and I will share this code as well. Your policy says, given an action, I'm now on line 38. So given an action S, tell me which action, sorry, given a state, apologies, given a state S, you want to retain the action that you perform. If your random number is less than epsilon, you select randomly from the, the possible actions. If not, you're selecting the action with the highest Q value. So I showed you the algorithm. I showed you the pseudocode. And now I'm showing you an actual Python implementation of this code. Just to make the point that this is within reach for you. Right. OK. So I will pause the, the sharing. And now, do we have any other questions? Let's have a conversation. Okay, so um, there we are. I think there are about three questions now. So someone is asking for uh, the concept behind reinforcement learning in self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. That's Timelay. Then the next question is from Mishak. So he's asking, is it possible to learn deep learning and reinforcement learning at the same time then so let me answer that one first okay the answer technically could be yes but i would actually suggest doing or learning deep learning first getting it out of your system because everybody likes deep learning <laughs> so spend the time learn it experience it because the reason why I'm saying that is there are elements of deep learning that you can apply within the context of reinforcement learning. And also linking to the previous question, so there are some applications of reinforcement learning to learn how to follow a path, and that's been applied in autonomous cars. So if you take the, the problem in, uh, in, if you simplify the problem of controlling a car autonomously, into, okay, can you learn to keep a car in a lane? You take the computer vision elements of it, you take the object detection elements of it, and you simplify it to, here is a car. That car has a camera. That camera is providing input about the environment. So you know the state of the environment as defined by the, the camera. Maybe you also know the state of the environment that's the car that the camera is in. So you can tell whether the gas is being pressed or whether the brake is being pressed. Is the wheel turning two degrees to the left or two degrees to the right? All of that information constitutes the state of the environment with the car in it. The actions that you can perform <coughs> in that environment might be stop the car meaning put the foot on the brake, or it might be put the foot on the accelerator, or it might be turn the wheel to the left or turn the wheel to the right. Those are the actions that you can take. So that's an example of how you would translate from an environment to a reinforcement learning problem. Now, you can use the same environment and do supervised learning. It's possible. But the RL framing of the problem is just a different framing to learn what actions or what sequence of actions make sense over time. All right, next question. Okay, so someone is asking is, um, okay, that's another question. Um, what are the mathematics and statistical knowledge that is needed to be good with reinforcement learning? That's from Shay. He's asking good what question. do I need in mathematics and statistics before going into reinforcement learning? So in terms of 
I view mathematics as a, as a subset of statistics, by the way. So let me first say, calculus helps. Algebra helps. Geometry, not so much. But there are probably ways that you could think about framing a problem using geometry. Intro probability and statistics would definitely help, especially when you get to uncertainty. So if you are trying to make a decision or an action in the presence of uncertainty, understanding probability distributions would really be useful. Um, I would also add uh, linear algebra might be useful as well, uh, just in terms of all around mathematical knowledge. So off the top of my head, those are the things that I would suggest having exposure to one course or if you can do a two course sequence, that might be helpful. Okay, so what the last question I'm seeing here is, can reinforcement learning be used instead of deep learning in most or every use case or are there limitations? So it's not, a, I wouldn't, so the answer I would give is no. And it's not that it's one or the other. They're addressing similar problems in different ways. So it's not, and also, as I mentioned, you can use, there's such a thing as deep reinforcement learning. The question is this, if you had labeled data, then you can address the problem, for example, of autonomous driving using reinforcement learning. But that means that the solutions that you develop are contingent completely on the data sets that were used to generate that learning. So what you are learning when you train your, your neural network in that context or supervised learning mechanism in that context, what you are learning is what is the controller that I need to control this car? An alternative approach is if you had an environment, either a real car or a simulated car that you can have the system learn from, you now have the benefit of being able to say, I have time, I will learn by driving this car in the real world or in the simulated world. So I don't view it actually as an either or. There are elements of both that I think would probably be relevant in most real world problems. Okay, thank question. you so much, sir. There's one last question I'm seeing here. There is from Baba Tunde. So he's asking, can reinforcement learning be useful for a mechanical engineering graduate student? Short answer, yes. <laughs> Longer answer. Um, there's, either, there's actually a mechanical engineering student that I met as an undergrad. Um, at the time that I met him, he was interested in this RL thing, but he, hadn't, he didn't feel comfortable with his computer science. So he was basically kind of just looking at it from the side. Um, I did research with him for two semesters, right before he graduated. And he ended up taking that experience and applying it to a graduate degree in the context of uh, learning controllers for quad rotors. So um, those helicopters that have four propellers. Really interesting dynamical system. So all of the experience that he had with um, uh, orthogonal projections, like the, the, the many of the things that electrical engineers sometimes do as well in terms of control theory mechanical engineers do as well, but with an emphasis on physical systems. His interest was now learning to control those physical systems. So he was actually, I mean, he graduated, I think two years ago, and now has a job working in a autonomous, I think they call it like autonomous space or some cookie name like that, but basically uh, controlling helicopters. Okay, so someone is asking for, He's asking your take on um, re the reinforcement um, learning agent that was used um, in AlphaGo 
-hmm. that the agent took a strange move um, during the game and he's just asking, what can you actually say about that? That's from Jeremiah. <laughs> Jeremiah is asking provocative questions. <laughs> the politically correct answer for me to say is, all of these agents or, or algorithms that we implement, their job is to learn. Their job is to maximize rewards. There's an element of explainability, which is very front and center these days, not just in supervised or unsupervised or classifiers or whatever, even in reinforcement learning. So one of the questions that exists is, can you understand what it is your agent is actually learning? That exists in reinforcement learning as well. The, I can speak a little bit about Jeopardy because um, IBM was the, the, the company that uh, participated in that um, humans versus machines Jeopardy edition. And in some of the early, uh, early forms, you're able to look at how, uh, <laughs> how the system or how the, the estimate is really wrong. But you can do that if you're training, if you're in a testing environment, if you're in a sandbox. If you were deploying this for real in the competition, you don't know. You can only look and say, here's the information that was presented at the time. Here is why, hopefully you can say, here is why my agent selected that action, even though that action was not the best. In most cases, there is an exploration exploitation trade-off. So you will always have a degree of selecting an action that may not be the best so that you can learn more information. But there's sometimes where the state that you think the system is in is not the state that the system is actually in. So the evidence that's presented to the agent via the state is not what you think. So it's almost like you're looking at somebody else drive a car and sometimes you're wondering, I don't know what that driver is doing, but if you could see inside their head, maybe you might understand, ah, that's why they made that decision. With our, with our especially with our deep reinforcement learning um, applications, it's getting much, much harder to do that. Okay, so um, the, the, last, the last couple of questions are, they are just asking for a career directive somewhat. So people are asking practical applications of reinforcement learning in chemical engineering, in telecommunications, just um, around career directives, where to go from here. Okay. So if you have any advice for um, them, that'd be... So the short answer to that, I mean, these are two really, really good domains to apply RL. And there are applications in the field already. So the, the telecommunications one, um, that's actually live. So I did have a, a reference to a paper that you can now go find. Actually, it's, uh, let, me, let me quickly skip some pages here. So that you can do this now. What slide was that? Yeah. So this dynamic channel assignment, that's straight up um, um, telecom. The question about chemical engineering. So if you think about bioreactors and the tuning the, the, the chemical composition at different stages over time. Yes, that is something that can be done. Um, so chemical engineering, um, biomedical engineering, there are elements of this. The core is you have a system that you're trying to learn how to control. And there may be a very large number of possible things you can do. In that context, you want to learn what's the benefit of doing something at a particular time, right? If you didn't care about time, you can just treat it as a, a treat it in essence as a, as a deterministic optimization or stochastic optimization problem. But if time matters, 
that's when we're really talking about the value of reinforcement learning, right? And so process engineering all over that. So yes, there is stuff in Kenny. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, I think, uh, okay, we have 10 minutes more till the end of this session. But mm -hmm. then I, I feel like data science, I, this is the time for you to appreciate Dr. Vermi. So all the awesomes, all the fire emojis, this is about the time. Say <laughs> thank you to Dr. Remy for everything he has done. Did you see how well he broke down this, this complicated structure called reinforcement learning to everybody, for everybody to learn? Yeah, he has also turned on his video. Thank you, thank you. There are, there are also, there, there are so many people saying thank you, thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Um, so so some of this talk I had actually prepared for uh, the deep learning in DABA last year. And oh, wow. I was so disappointed when we didn't get the chance to have a, an in-person in DABA this year. So I'm happy that, that uh, Dr. Bayo was able to, to invite me to this because I've been waiting for a while. There's a lot <laughs> of amazing things that I'm seeing via Twitter. So keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, everybody's saying thank you. Thank you so much. Thank All right. You. So I look forward to catching you on that Twitter site. <laughs> I am not as active as I could be, but more active than I am on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. So I will catch you there. Okay. So they have your LinkedIn and Twitter. Everybody's okay. saying thank you. Thank you so much. So at this point, we can go back to the main session whilst we're waiting for the other group of people to come back in. Okay. So this is the end of this breakout session. Thank you so much, Dr. Remy. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, guys, we should be heading back to the main session. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have another session by 2.30, starting by, is it starting by, no, it's starting by, yes. We have another session starting by 2.30. That's if you pick that stream, then there's another session starting by 3.30 as well. So make sure you choose and pick and know where we're headed. Thank you so much for joining. We're still getting awesome comments. Thank you, thank you so much. So let's go back to the main breakout session, to the main session now.